I am Gwen Pearson, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, and it is the parable that Jesus taught about ten virgins, or bridesmaids, who are waiting for the groom. And there are some really interesting insights I would like to share with you. So, starting with verse 1, and if you hear any queek, queek, queek in the background, this is Georgia. It, it is hot today. So the insects are humming along. So, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they didn't take oil with them. But the wise ones took oil in their flasks with their lamps. When the groom was delayed, they all became drowsy oh, and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, there was a shout. Here comes the groom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins got up and they trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise ones, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. The wise ones answered, No, there won't be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. When they had gone to buy some, the groom arrived, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. Yay! And the door was shut. Later, the rest of the virgins also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. He replied, Truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, be alert, because you don't know either the day or the hour. All right, so some interesting insights. First of all, the number 10. 10, right away, I think of the Ten Commandments. So what I think is kind of interesting is that Jesus used the number 10 because that refers to the law. It means it's important, the law, and we should be considering those Ten Commandments and not just fluff them off like they're not important. What I think is very interesting is that all ten of them thought they were on the same page together. They were all waiting for the groom. And the five wise didn't really know that the five others were foolish. They just thought they were like them. They didn't discern. Wait a minute, you guys aren't ready. Do you realize that? Where's your flask? Um, the other five who were foolish, well, they didn't really look at the five who were wise. They weren't saying, hmm, they've thought this through. Uh, what if the room delays? Uh, maybe we should have also gotten some oil. So I think right there on that first line of defense looking at this parable is that these ten didn't really know each other. <laughs> and, and they didn't know that the five were not like them. So that's point number two. And then another point I think that is really interesting is that they all fell asleep. Not just the five foolish, but the five wise. And yet, the real test comes when, it says, in the middle of the night, which could have been midnight or later, there's this shout. Here's the groom, come out to meet him. And this is where we see their true colors because the wise were ready. They were excited, yay! Whereas the five foolish were not ready and they saw right away, they didn't have any oil. So they left to buy some. And then point four, it's a little scary. Is that when the ones who weren't ready, the foolish ones, they knocked at the door expecting of course the groom to say, oh, well, come on in, ladies. I'm so glad you finally made it, even though you're really late. In fact, they're absolutely shocked to hear that the groom says, I don't know you. What a shock. 
in Greek is very interesting because in the Greek, what it means also is, I can't see you. So here it is, darkness. And Jesus is telling the story, representing him, when he's going to be coming in the darkness and he can't see these five women because they don't have oil. What does the oil represent? The oil represents the Holy Spirit. And so this is the issue. There are a lot of believers who think they are. And they might have really good reason to think they are because they go to church and they may go to Bible studies. They may read the Bible from time to time and they might witness. And they think they're believers. Yet, they don't have the oil, the Holy Spirit. They've never given themselves over to God as their King, as their Lord, as their Savior, as their groom. They kind of seem to be the kind of Christians that just go along to get along. They like the ambiance, you know, they like the kindness that everybody has towards each other. Well, it's another good time, you know, going socially to church and saying, hi, how are you? But there's no in-depth, real deep relationships that are being built. So I think this is very interesting that the 10 virgins or the 10 bridesmaids really didn't know each other that well, which I think corresponds to how Jesus sees the last church before he comes for the bride. The Laodicean church is very lukewarm. He said to that church, he would rather they be hot or cold, but because they're lukewarm, he would vomit them out of his mouth. Not such a good way to be seen. So I would say that we are in these days where we really don't know each other that well. We're kind of anonymous. I mean, you can go into a church and say, hello, nice to see you. Oh, yeah, yeah. You might even go to a Bible study. Oh, yes, I, yes, I absolutely agree with this passage. Oh, yes. But really, do we know each other? If, as Christians, we're not shining like we're different, like we're visible in the dark, like we're saying, whoa, I don't agree with all the evil that's being accepted today. I'm against what the Bible is against. And I'm for what the Bible is for. And we don't make any distinction, meaning that we say we received Jesus, we might have prayed the prayer, but do our lives show it? Are we conformed to this world? Do we watch the movies? Do we watch the TV shows? And do we accept what we're seeing as, oh yeah, that's fine, sure. Fornication's good, adultery's okay, you know, it's not maybe the best, but you know, that's okay, Jesus forgives. Homosexuality is fine, oh, abortion of course is fine, you know, the woman's choice. And in the end, we don't make any distinction between the world and us. We just kind of blend in, we're a part of the darkness, there's no light. And I think that's one reason why Jesus says, I don't see you, you have no light. You're not a light in the darkness. It is getting darker. Look at what they're trying to push on children. Oh, sure, you don't need to think you're a boy. Why don't you try being a girl? Or, yeah, why don't you try being a boy? And we'll give you hormones. If people don't see that that's really wicked and evil for children to do that kind of thing to them, we didn't do that during World War II, and we didn't do that during World War I. There was actually more morals going on in that time period than there are now. So if we're saying it's not very dark, I would say, look how children are being raised. And I would say, it's pretty dark. So when Jesus says, therefore be alert because you don't know either the day or the hour, that should not be an excuse, which it is for quite a few Christians. Oh, well, since we're not supposed to know the day or hour. Who cares when Jesus is coming? I'm not going to bother looking and checking to see the signs and wondering if it could be my generation. I mean, 
it's been going on like this for centuries. Christians have thought that Jesus is coming back. So, yeah, we can't know either the day or hour. And so they use that as an excuse to not look at any signs of the times. And Jesus specifically gave us signs in chapter 24. When you see all these things, recognize that he is near at the door. So truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. What things? Well, if you read chapter 24, he actually describes the tribulation period, starting in especially verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So you have to go to the prophet Daniel and you have to go to chapter 9 and you need to read it and look at specifically verse 27. And Daniel is talking about this abomination of desolation when a man calls himself God in the third rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And this is specifically talking to the Jews, not to Christians, to the Jews, because Jesus says, so those in Judea must flee to the mountains. So, you know, Jews live in Judea. And then he goes on and says, pray that your escape may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Talking about Jews, they're the ones that keep and hold to the Sabbath. For at that time there will be great distress, the kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. This is talking about the tribulation period. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding grain with a hand mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore be alert since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. That is why you are also to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So for those Christians who rely on that verse, well, we can't know the day or hour, and they hide behind that, so we, you know, don't want to hear, see, talk about the rapture or Jesus coming. Jesus is saying he's coming as a thief. And let's remind ourselves that Jesus would be an honest thief. Why? Because he has bought what he's going to steal. And what is he going to steal? He's going to steal the bride. He purchased her with his blood. And he's entering into enemy territory. Yes, the earth is cursed. And it is ruled by the enemy, Satan. And all of the kingdoms right now are run by him. Yet he is on a leash and Jesus is holding that leash. But he is letting it go. And then we will see the complete evil behind Satan as he controls all these people during the tribulation. But the good news is he's going to take the bride out before the tribulation period happens. And this I base on what Paul has said and what Jesus has said. Right here in this chapter of 24, and chapter 25, I hope and pray that you want to say this prayer if you've never prayed it before. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that I have been very conformed to this world. I have agreed and gone along with the world's way of seeing love. That I can fornicate and I can commit adultery and I can be a homosexual and it doesn't matter because it's all love. And I can almost be a pedophile because it's love towards a child. And I do not want to be conformed to this world's thinking anymore. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, by reading your word and believing it and letting it enter into me so that I am more Christ-like in all my ways, in the ways I think, in the ways that I act. And so Lord, I pray that if anyone is really ready to pray this prayer, they will pray, Lord Jesus, come into my life and make me the person you want me to be. Because I don't want to be left behind like the five foolish virgins. I want to be taken 
I don't want to be a part of the tribulation period, which is the flood. God's wrath, it's his judgment on this earth, which is overdue. So, Lord, please bless your word and bless whoever has watched this, that they believe and receive your son as their king, as their God, as their Lord and Savior and groom. It's in Jesus' name, pray all these things, amen, and Maranatha, God bless you.